Jayla Shaushi Nicole Butler Hooten. I'm a member of the Confederated Tribes of Siletz of Oregon, the Chetco Band, and the San Carlos Apache Tribe of Arizona. I have been an educator for 15 years, teaching mostly second and fourth grade. This year, I've stepped out of the classroom to become an instructional coach, and so I'm supporting teachers who are new to the profession and those within their first three years of teaching. And I'll tell you what, teachers need it right now. And it's so awesome to be able to be in all the classroom spaces to still get my teaching on and to be with kids every day. So I am really excited to be here with all of you today for the Eastern Oregon Teacher Academy 2022. I so wish that I could be in person. Um, I have such a busy June, but just know that I'm thinking of all of you and I really want to partner with you over these next few years. So I hope today that you'll be able to find some entry into the work that you're doing. I do want to acknowledge that teachers are very fragile right now. So I honor and applaud you for going into this profession because we need more quality teachers. So I can't wait to do this work together with all of you. Thank you for being here. I know online keynotes are a little bit tricky, but um, I'm really excited to deliver a message and hopefully you'll find some excitement and engagement and entry around some of the um, some of the work that I've done. So um, I'll share a little bit about everything and um, you know, please think about questions that you may have and we can do that virtually. So um, if I look over to the side, I'm just looking at my computer, but um, again, thank you for having me. I do wanna shout out to Dave Dallas and all of the Eastern Oregon University staff at the teacher ed programs because um, really centering students' needs and educator needs um, is what we need in our profession. So thank you so much. Um, for having me today and let's get started. I want us to be thinking about how we can humanize educational spaces for our students today. That's something that I've been really thinking about is the humanization behind education, right? We all can think back to our schooling, our years that we had, those teachers that we remember, but what is our commitment as teachers to really humanize all aspects of school so that our students walk away and they know that we're not only part of their educational career for that year, but for their entirety of their career. So it takes a team, it takes a village, and it takes people like you to do this work. So on our agenda today, we're going to do a land acknowledgement. We're going to do a little bit of gratitude. I think that that's a great way to start our work. We're going to talk about my why for culturally responsive teaching, and I want you to think critically about your why because there's a story out there. We're gonna talk about Oregon's Senate Bill 13, our tribal shared history curriculum. We'll talk about how to move the equity work forward and how to think critically about culturally responsive pedagogy. And then we'll also um, close out and I'll share some resources that I use. I have a quote that I want us to think about um, as we are doing this work together. To bring about change, you must not be afraid to take the first step. We will fail when we fail to try. That's Rosa Parks. So thinking about how we change the world, you're going to do that every day when you get into your spaces, but we have to try and we have to try hard things. So it's customary in my tradition to really think about a land acknowledgement as a fluid way to really honor the land that we live and reside on. So I'm gonna deliver a land acknowledgement today. And I want you to think about if you've heard a land acknowledgement before, how that has sat with you, if that's something that you've had questions about. Um, I just want you to think about and jot anything down that I can help with. Because I know when I first heard a land acknowledgement, I was like, what was that? Who can do that? You know, I wasn't even sure that I could give myself permission to be a part of it, even as a native person person. So I just want to deliver a land acknowledgement because it's customary in my tradition to start off in a good way. I want to acknowledge the land that I am on right now. I am on the traditional homelands of the Kalapuya tribe here in Eugene, Oregon. I think I mentioned this earlier, but I'm in the longhouse at the University of Oregon, the Many Nations longhouse. So I'd like to give a shout out to Katie Staten for letting us use this beautiful space today which feels like home. So where I am, I am on the traditional homelands of the Kalapuya tribe, who once were forcibly removed following the 1855 Willamette Valley Treaty. And they are now members, living descendants of the Confederated Tribes of Siletz of Oregon and the Confederated Tribes of Grand Ronde. 
And when I deliver a land acknowledgement, I tell students what that means. And I explain it in more um, kid-friendly terms, where that there were people living in this area where we go to school at, where we shop at, where we play sports at. And then in 1855, they were forcibly removed. And I asked students to reflect on that and to really think about how they feel, um, knowing that where we live, this land used to belong to someone else here in Eugene. So land acknowledgement can be a way to share stories. It can be a way to disrupt a previously held narrative, it can be a way to strengthen the indigenous presence and honor those people who came before you. So as you think about the land that you live on, that you go to school on, that you teach on, who was there before you? What are you willing to do to repair the relationship with our Native communities, our Native family members, and our Native students. We know that there are still many um, treaties that have not been honored due to deceptive and broken treaties. We know that colonization is an ongoing process. So I ask educators when I deliver a keynote, what are you doing to preserve the land for future generations? What are you doing to honor the tribal land that you live and reside on? Thank you for listening to the land acknowledgement. I do want to say that a land acknowledgement should have intentionality and action behind it, right? We're not just reading this to, to sit in that discomfort and go, wow, that, that landed some sort of way, but really to think about the action. What, what's to follow the land acknowledgement? So I would highly encourage all of you as pre-service teachers and as educators to think about the relationship that you have with the nine federally recognized tribes of Oregon and with your commitment to the implementation of our Oregon's Tribal Shared History Curriculum, Senate Bill 13. Those are both great ways to start this work. Okay, so thanks for listening to the land acknowledgement. We'll start with a little bit of gratitude. If you have something to write on, please get that out and you can number from one to three. Um, but I really think it's a good spot for us to start. Um, and I was just subbing in a classroom. And so to come and deliver this keynote just feels so meaningful to me. So if you can think about something today that made you smile and write it down. I was thinking something that made me smile was I walked into this classroom and I had only subbed in there maybe one other time, but this is the school um, I used to teach at. So um, I have a strong connection to the staff and students. And I had some of these students a couple years ago. And this little student runs up to me and she says, you're my favorite sub ever. And I was thinking to myself, well, I've only subbed in here one other time, but anyways, it made me smile. And then if you can think about something that you can lose time in, something that keeps you busy and occupied, and write that down. I also have a quote up here that makes me smile, um, but also I can lose time in when I can't find my phone. And it says, you know you're a teacher when you remember the names of 427 students, but you can't remember where you left your phone. And when you get into your classroom spaces, that'll happen a lot. So, um, and then just another thing that I can lose time in is professional development and thinking about resources that I can use to better my teaching and to really deepen my practice as an educator. Uh, my husband's always going, oh, another book arrived. And so um, I wish that we could, I could hear what you all are saying, but maybe you could have a little table talk um, with your colleagues to be able to be thinking about some of these questions. And the last question I'd like you to think about to bring some gratitude and some grounding to our work would be a legacy question. As I mentioned, I'm an instructional coach and I get to work with 17 different um, educators across five schools. And I'm asking them at the end of the year to think of their legacy question. What do you want your students to remember about you? And you might think about your favorite educators and what you remember about them. But if you don't mind just thinking about that, what do you want your students to remember about you? Something that I um, always reflect on is I, I want students to feel loved. I want them to know that I'm not just part of their educational journey today in second or fourth grade, but it will continue to the future. So I'd like to make some acknowledgements today as we do this work that students and families are doing their best. We have to humanize our educational experiences for all students. And teaching is about addressing equity. I'm going to say that again. Teaching is about addressing equity. Also, I want to share and acknowledge that Oregon's Tribal Shared History curriculum is for all educators. And I hope that you'll get training in your licensure program. But if not, there are plenty of resources, and I'll share about that in a little bit. I also want to acknowledge that we may need to sit in discomfort to do the equity work to support students, to keep students engaged, and to ask for help when we need it. I also want to acknowledge that we've made it through, I'm going to do quotes, a few pandemic years, 
and you're all here. That's a great sign. And then I also want to acknowledge that now is the time to address the racial climate, especially that in our schools. Okay, moving on, I wanna share a little bit about myself. I know I introduced myself um, and that was in my day any language, but I also want to share my equity stance. And my equity stance is a way that I introduce myself. It's a guide for the work that I do. I want us to think about it as a way to really align our initiatives and our practice and to find ways to continue to grow as educators. So in Bethel School District, we're really working on our equity stance as a way to guide our practice. There's an I am section, an I believe, and an I will section. And I'm going to read mine. And as I read my equity stance, I would like you to think about where you could start with your equity stance. Maybe it's your identity and you're just going to start with the I am portion. If you feel comfortable, you could move on to the I believe and then to the I will. I am a mother, a wife, a teacher, a runner, a believer. I am a Celeste and San Carlos Apache tribal member. I am a lifelong learner. I am the change. I am the 2021 Oregon Teacher of the Year. I believe in order to teach a child, you need to know the child. I believe in social justice work and anti-racist curriculum. I believe in creating more equitable outcomes for our students. I believe in rigor and access in the classroom. I believe making mistakes help us learn. Second graders love to remind me of that. I believe empowerment comes from representation. I'm gonna say that one more time. I believe empowerment comes from representation. And I think that that's really critical in certain parts of our state where we have different amounts of racial diversity because that empowerment and that representative space that we hold is so critical. I believe in humanizing our educational spaces. I know you're probably sick of hearing that already. I will, so this is my commitment. These are the intentionalities that I'm going to live out. I will be empathetic and honest and recognize the privilege I hold. I will be a mentor to my students and honor each student for the gifts that they bring to my educational space. I will be intentional with my classroom management and systems. I will engage families in the learning process and create family partnerships. I will show students respect and examples of resilience. I will overcome my past and current traumas, that one I'm still working on. I will build positive relationships with my students and my families, right? Those families, those are those authentic partnerships that you want to nurture. I will teach my children our tribal traditions and values. So again, this is my equity stance, and this is a way that I introduce myself in educational spaces. You can have a professional equity stance and a personal equity stance. They can change with each season, but I would really encourage you to start an equity stance as a way to really guide your teaching, your learning, and as a way to deepen your practice and be reflective, right? We all want to be those reflective practitioners, and sometimes that takes time, um, Side note, I do want to say that during my first couple years of teaching, I did have a mentor and she encouraged me to journal and to write down positives and negatives, things that went well, things that I want to work on, because you forget about them when you have those 25 littles in front of you. So um, just thinking about how you could begin your equity stance, what this work means to you. Um, you'll see some pictures up on the screen, and um, the one on the top is me um, running a half marathon out near Blue Pool up the McKenzie River. Um, and if you've never been, it's phenomenal, so you'll have to go sometime. And then the other picture is my husband and I on our wedding day. And then I have our Celeste and Apache tribal seal, our flags. And then um, you'll see a picture of me and my husband, Matt, my daughter, Avery. She's um, almost 11 and a sixth grader. And then my son, Beckett, he's seven and a first grader. And then my teacher of the year plaque. And then you'll also see a picture of me. You know when you get those really good school pictures or like your really good license picture and you're like, hey, I still want to look like that. So I just, I love to show that picture. That was from my second year teaching. So um, thinking about an equity stance as a way to guide your practice can be really helpful my indigenous educator journey. So 
when I was a young student, I grew up on the rural Oregon coast. Um, I know um, La Grande is also a rural area, um, bigger than the town that I grew up in, Reedsport. Um, but I was one of the only brown students. I didn't see really teachers or educators that looked like me when I was in school. My identity was not accurately depicted. I didn't hear positive affirmations about indigenous people or native people. I heard nothing about my tribe. I was only an hour and a half from the reservation. And so that really impacted my indigenous educator journey. And it really made me want to feel seen in these spaces even more, right? Some students can take that and they, they can go the other way with that. But me feeling unseen, I wanted to form relationships with my educators. I wanted to think critically about how I could use education as a tool to help me. And my grandparents um, were so so integral to this process of helping me be seen in educational spaces. They always empowered me and they wanted me to be the best version of myself that I could be. So on the screen, you're gonna see little Nicole, who is, um, those are a couple first grade pictures of me. And then to the right, you're going to see some writing. And I show this every year in my classroom. And this is my actual writing in first grade, Mr. Hathorn. He said, how do you want to change the world? What do you want to do when you grow up? You know, we ask students those questions sometimes. And rather than posing it like, what do you want to be? I usually ask students, how do you want to change the world? And so I said, when I grow up, there are many things to be when you grow up. I want to be a school teacher because I like school very much. And I think although I felt unseen, I felt empowered by learning and I felt empowered by my educators. And I don't even think they realized in some situations that they were using culturally responsive teaching because it wasn't representative in the literature or the curriculum, but their relationships with me were what were so important and what I remember. And I kind of get chills thinking about Mr. Hathorne because I was a struggling math student. I was a Title I reading student. I received speech therapy services, but I had support. I had supportive teachers who loved and cared about me. And my birthday was last week and Mr. Hathorne even sent me a Facebook message. And um, my fifth grade teacher, Mr. Pepio, he, bless his heart, he passed away last year, but every year sending me messages. Um, his wife was my kindergarten teacher. So students will remember the relationship that you have with them. So I wanted to share a little bit about some of the self-doubt and shame that I felt, but that was really brought to life with relationships. And so if I can say anything today, please walk away with, we want students to feel loved and respected and seen in educational spaces. And we wanna make sure that you, as the educator, really think about giving students access, opportunity, and accurate representation. Things that I never had, and maybe that some people in this room never had. So the, a little bit about me, after I, um, was in elementary school. Then I went on to the University of Oregon, where I am now. And um, I attended the Sopsiquatla program, which is a teacher education program for um, you getting your master's degree for native teachers. And so it was really a way for me to even strengthen my culturally responsive lens even further, right? Be given To be given this opportunity to come and be with other indigenous educators and to feel really seen for who I was, it was like you couldn't stop me then. <laughs> So um, I have a little video that I think this was the video that I was going to share. Um, this was two years ago, right? So we were in a pandemic two years ago. And I thought this just might give you a glimpse into, which I hope we don't go back to, but it might give you a glimpse into education online, which many of us know what that felt like, um, how second graders really rallied. This is a video that I made for the Oregon State School Board Association for when I won Oregon Teacher of the Year. You have to share a little bit about your experience in the classroom. And I don't know about you, but I always want to see teachers teaching and in action and how they engage and what their dialogue looks like and their relationships. And so um, I do seem really happy in these videos, but it was because it was one of the first time also that I had seen students. They were coming to pick up homework packets and things like that. So um, I was pretty peppy then. But um, I'm going to show this video. It's about five minutes. If you think about um, anything, any takeaways, maybe write a few things down. Chela Shaushi, Nicole Butler Hooten. I'm a member of the San Carlos Apache Tribe and the Confederated Tribes of Siletz Indians. I'm a second grade teacher in the Bethel School District in Eugene. 
So make sure that you have your supplies. Check in with your space where you are right now. Mrs. Butler's gonna do that too, okay? I've taught at Irving for 14 years. 14 years I focused on creating strong connections with families, focusing on culturally responsive teaching and equity in the classroom. Mr. Miles, can you unmute and read all of our agreements? Thank you, Oregon State Board Association members, and thank you for this wonderful honor of 2021 Oregon State Teacher of the Year. I grew up on the Oregon coast in a rural community. Growing up as one of the only Native American families in the town really helped me create my why for teaching. Teachers reached out and went above and beyond to make me feel welcome. They made my family feel welcome. Learning transcended the classroom in many ways. Phone calls, positive affirmations, parent to home connections. When they would see my family members in the store, they would reach out. Those were meaningful to me. I knew that my educators cared and loved me. Thinking about my grandfather and my grandmother, their experience in the educational setting I think has helped shaped me and who I am. My grandfather grew up and went to a Native American boarding school where he was taught that his culture wasn't important. My grandmother left her reservation with limited English and they formed a family bond that taught myself and other family members how important education was. They worked hard to teach family values while also being proud of who we are. My teachers made me always feel that I was part of the learning community. As a struggling reader in Title I, I knew that my teachers believed in me. My first grade teacher asked me what I wanted to be when I grew up, and I said I wanted to be a teacher. And here I am. I still have my writing on the walls in my classroom, and I share that every year. My teachers believed in me. They helped me get where I am, and I owe them a big gratitude for supporting and encouraging. And though they may have not even known that they were using their culturally responsive lens, today I am here as proof that they were. But I didn't have teachers of color until I attended the University of Oregon. Once there, I saw teachers and students who looked like me, and that was valuable. And I think at that time, I really did take ownership over my cultural identity and became very proud of who I was. This is Mrs. Butler's self-portrait. I felt like I belonged, and that feeling was a new feeling for me. It's important for our students today that we get to know their historical and cultural backgrounds and the, ne the inequities that they may have faced. By having educators of color in our classrooms today, our students may be able to have those multiple perspectives which help give them their sense of belonging in the classroom. Parker, can you participate with your thumb? Oh yeah, go potty and then come right back. During this distance learning, this has been challenging for us all. How are you? Good to see you, bud. Oh, I like your mask. What's on it, a chicken? How are you, Lou? Something that I know that made a very big impact on our families, and it seemed like a simple gesture from my student teacher and I, was that um, I wanted my students to see me face to face well, mask to mask. And so we drove around and we did 22 home visits and we dropped off a welcome package for each student and we got to see them at a socially distant space and it was very meaningful for my families. I know that that will create a relationship that is valuable and that is a spot in students and parents' minds that will help guide our year we set that framework at the beginning about how much the teacher and parent relationship can impact students. And by doing such acts, it can really make each student feel as a valuable part of the education process. Jack is doing wonderful, he is. is. I know yeah. that this isn't easy for any of us. He said, well, I'm pretty sure I'm going to grandma, so I don't think I'm gonna have time to get my work. <laughs> I said, I bet your dad will come by. If there's a day where you're feeling like, I just can't do it, he can't do it, then you just send me that message and say, but we're gonna try a Zoom. The other activities that maybe are frustrating or can you explain a little bit more? Layla, let's go find your bag. Miss Layla, yours is right here. And there's all sorts of goodies in there and I wrote you a little note on top. Would a video be helpful to go with the math or is he feeling pretty successful? Checking in with parents, emails, communication, we're all doing those things, but it's the little bit more that we can do as teachers that they will remember forever.
Bye. Love ya. She's just the sweetest little bug. As teacher of the year with this platform, I hope to continue my culturally responsive teaching. I hope to continue that professional development and share with all teachers why it is so important to use our equity lens as we teach our ever-changing populations of students. It's important for us as teachers to continue to build community each and every day, getting to know our families and students on a more personal level. We value students, we make the connections, we take the time, and teachers truly are life changers for some of these students who really need that relationship. Distance learning has been a challenge for most students, teachers, and families. My charge to you, school board members, is to continue the work to keep our class sizes manageable, to help increase counseling supports in our schools, to help with the mental health needs of our students, and to continue providing access to technology for students and teachers. Thank you, school board members, for your service for your time. Thank you for this wonderful award of Oregon Teacher of the Year. I'm going to continue to use my voice to support all students and educators. I really want to leave you with a quote that's something that drives my teaching each and every day. Be the change you wish to see in the world. Thank you. Okay, well thank you so much for watching that video. I hope that you found a little bit um, of excitement around relationship building and how we can do this work collectively. And then also just thinking about, this was a message to school boards, but also thinking about how you can partner with your district, your district level leadership and your school boards so that you can have meaningful relationships because that's how we're gonna move the work. That's how we're gonna really think about collectivity and human-centered approaches to learning is when we think about educational systems as a team and we think about systemic change that can be happening in our schools. Okay, well, let's move on here. Um, for pre-service teachers, I thought where to start. And one area that I really want us to think about is the idea of creating diverse experiences for our students. And um, I also should mention I'm a PhD student in my first year and um, three more years to go, but it's it's been a vibe. It's been really exciting to be able to relearn some um, practices and to think about methodology, things that I hadn't thought about for a bit because I'd been teaching so long and reading second grade material and fourth grade material. So this graphic up on the screen just talks a little bit about diversity proficiencies. And we think about proficiencies for our students, but let's take a minute to really reflect on our practice as early childhood educators, practitioners, wherever you are in the K-12 systems. So this shows a little bit about awareness of ourself, understanding the learner, our learning environment, the planning, instruction, and assessment that we need to be thinking about, and then our professional practice and that ongoing professional development. And thinking about the intersection of diversity proficiencies, um, I'd like you to just think critically for a minute about where this could fit in to your work and how this impacts your work as a culturally responsive educator. Okay, the next um, really meaningful space that I wanna create today is for Zaretta Hammond. I don't know how many of you have read Culturally Responsive Teaching in the Brain, but we read it in our district about six years ago. And again, it's Culturally Responsive Teaching in the Brain by Zaretta Hammond. And I think for any educator at any point in their career, it can be so meaningful. So as I mentioned, relationships are so crucial for our students. And one of the questions I get asked is, is how do you make those relationships that really transcend the classroom? And so thinking about the culture tree that's on the screen, um, if you think about the different layers of a tree, the different parts of a tree, I should say, and then if you think about the different layers and levels of culture and what that looks like when our students enter into our classroom spaces, right? We want to get to know them and everything about them so that we can guide them. And that so learning can come secondly to that relationship. So if we look at this graphic, you'll see that the leaves represent the surface culture. And then you'll get a little bit into the trunk and then you see some of the shallow culture. And then the roots are the deep culture. That's the part as educators that sometimes I'll say is missing as we do this work together. If we really want to make these relationships meaningful with our students and sustainable, we have to really think about that deep culture, the roots of the tree. And if you look down there, right, those are going to be harder to change over time. So think about 
how you as an educator can use the levels of culture to really think about how to impact your students, how to disrupt stereotypes in curriculum, how to think about alignment and engagement and reaching our students, especially those from cultural backgrounds that may be different from our own. I always say this when I give keynotes because I think it's something that really stands out to me and stood out to me as an educator was we all benefit from multiple perspectives in history. And I've been reading a book, or I've already finished it, but it's Coaching for Equity by Elena Aguilar. And she tells us and reminds us that educational spaces, schools, can be places of healing. And that's what we want, places of healing for our students. And it starts with understanding our students' culture and where they come from and what their lived experience looks like. So as we move on, I want us to think about our classroom context as we go out into buildings, as we start building the relationships. And um, you're going to learn, and you probably already have had some discussions about these concepts, but anti-oppressive pedagogy, what does that look like when it's in practice? How do we disrupt those negatives? How do we think about that educational equity is not directly correlated with one certain factor? one certain social or cultural factor, right? That educational equity, we can start with that. We can think about entry into this work. And we have to think about that with our classroom, our classroom culture, the power, the community, the shared power. And I love this quote that I put up here. And if you've never read Django Paris, he's one of my go-tos when I really need to think critically about how to align or disrupt systems or how to engage or reach students on another level. Maybe it's not in the curriculum. Maybe I just haven't had that opportunity. And he says this, Culturally sustaining pedagogy exists wherever education sustains the lifeways of communities who have been and continue to be damaged and erased through schooling. So if you think about those systems of schooling, those policies, those procedures, and then we think about those students who are continually left out, right? We ask ourselves, whose voice is at the table? Who's represented in this story? Who's not represented in this story? I was subbing in a fifth grade classroom a couple weeks ago. It was actually my daughter's fifth grade classroom. And I was reading this story and it was a pioneer story. And it was a recollection of a young girl um, on the Oregon Trail. And um, this was Journey's reading curriculum. So it's only about eight years old. We're just doing a reading adoption now. But I'm reading this story with fifth graders. And I immediately had this visceral reaction to this story because she kept referring to the Native American as the brave and she was fearful of him. And I understand this was her recollection and that this was important part. But again, I asked myself, well, what part is missing? What part of this story is missing? And so, you know me, I just jumped right in. It's like, okay, why was she afraid of the Native American? Why was she afraid of the brave? Why is she calling him a brave? What, you know? And so we talked a lot about both sides and multiple perspectives because because if we're coming from one perspective, we can easily see that we have to disrupt that as educators. And I would just challenge you to think, how will you disrupt racist curriculum? Because it will happen, because it's still happening in 2022 in the classroom that I was in. And um, it takes time, it takes energy, it takes sitting in discomfort to really do this work well. Um, but I know that you can do it. And I know with time and practice, we, we all owe this to our students for educational equity. So um, thinking about Django Paris and thinking about how we consider our classroom context, we can disrupt we can work together to think systemically about what those systems look like. Um, you will be asked in your school district, I'm sure, to think about educational equity. We have district level leadership teams in our school. And so it's a really important time for you to think about the overall structure of your school and where you can insert yourself into better understanding what that equity work looks like. We know that for our marginalized students, we have to advocate. We, we have to get comfortable with that advocacy. And um, I think positioning yourself and finding a supportive team of people and learning that, that by failing forward, we can do this work collectively. 
Okay. Well, in my cohort for 2021 Oregon State Teacher of the Year, we've been talking a lot about this idea of humanizing educational spaces. So when we think about humanizing our educational spaces, we all may have different perspectives. But what I want to share is something um, where we think about excellence, we think about voice, we think about value of our students and what they bring. And we really think about fighting against the master narrative. And sometimes those master narratives are coming from a very colonized perspective. And so, of course, being an Indigenous person, I want to think about how to indigenize spaces, how to really come to spaces and center the voices that have often been unheard, have often been left out, and often those are our students of color. And um, so I want you to think about um, when you do this work, looking at the graphic and thinking about those resources that you may need, those people you may go to, how can we really uplift the pillar of education? How can we collectively build and sustain our spaces, our learning structures, and how can we challenge when we see disruptive, when we see racist practices happening in our spaces? To humanize really means to center our students and students' voice and shared power and privilege. And that comes with practice, that comes with intentionality. So I want us to think about how we humanize our spaces because that's a way that we're going to see we're going to see growth of our students. We're going to see the change happening. We're going to see education be more collective and human-centered. I really like this quote by Bell Hooks that um, I was recently asked to write a chapter in a book, and she says, dominator culture, right? Dominator culture, if we think about what that feels like, has tried to keep us all afraid to make us choose safety instead of risk, sameness instead of diversity, right? We talked about diversity earlier. Moving through that fear and finding out what really connects us, reveling in our differences. That's what I tell students. Oh, honoring those differences. That is the process that really brings us closer, that gives us a world of shared values and of meaningful community. And again, when I get asked, what is the best part of being a teacher? And I say the community, the community that you live and grow in and that you want to strengthen. So be thinking about how you can disrupt dominator culture and how you might use this quote to guide your teaching practice. Okay, I'm on to the part where I want to tell you a little bit about Teacher of the Year. I know that um, I often get asked as well, what is Teacher of the Year? What does it mean? I didn't even know it was an award when I won 2021 Oregon Teacher of the Year, the first Indigenous person to win this award, which is pretty spectacular. I always say my grandparents who have both passed, um, one was a Sluts and the other was an Apache tribal member. They would never believe that I'm here. Um, they would never believe that I got to have all these experiences. So um, it's been a really meaningful journey to me. I have just a short three minute video that was made by the Oregon Lottery. The Oregon Lottery sponsors, um, as you know, probably many educational um, awards, many educational initiatives. And so they've sponsored this. So I'd like to share this video and um, I hope you like it. At this time, it gives me great pleasure to announce our 2021 Oregon Teacher of the Year, Nicole Butler Hooten. I think that originally I wanted to be a teacher since a young age, since my family instilled in me the value of education. I remember when my grandpa and my dad used to go up to Alaska, go logging for months at a time, and they would write me letters. And the first question is, how is school? How are you doing in school? So many reasons why Nicole is an exceptional teacher. This school year, we talked a lot with staff about uh, virtual home visits and Nicole took it upon herself uh, to do socially distance home visits. So went to every student's home and connected with families. She wanted that personal connection. So I think in order to teach a child, you have to know the child. And I think that that comes with being consistent and loving and kind. I think understanding that each child has a unique circumstance, remembering that all students deserve respect and attention, and it's up to us to go the extra mile to be able to give that. Something I really liked about Ms. Butler was whenever we didn't know how to do something, she definitely didn't stop challenging us. She normally would go over it again with the whole class, which made me feel good. 
So I was learning the same thing as the whole class. She's done a really great job making sure like those students who need that extra support, like reaching out to them and intentionally having that one-on-one -on -one time as needed. Um, and then she also incorporates her culture in that. Like she mentions like, you know, this is my Native American heritage. Um, and like myself, I am a person of color too. And so um, just hearing that and just for her to integrate things about herself and modeling that for her students, fostering that sense of um, belonging and, and making it um, a space for students to feel like themselves. This was a, a very difficult uh, year. It, it just means so much to, to have Nicole be recognized uh, as 2021 Oregon Teacher of the Year. It just uh, gives a highlight to a lot of the work that we've been doing um, as a school and as a district and making sure that um, we are really reaching and, and inspiring our students. We have to think about that individual person, that individual student, and make sure that we're reaching them where they are and we're creating space for them in our classrooms. I hope that students will remember how much I loved them and the sense of belonging that they felt or feel when they come into my room. Okay, well, thank you so much for watching that video. And that's just an important part of the work that I've been doing this year. I've been given so many platforms to really stand up and advocate for teachers and what, um, what our profession needs. As I mentioned earlier, teachers are fragile. I know students are fragile right now coming off of a pandemic year. Um, it couldn't be a better time really truly to think about change, how we change our educational spaces. And so I'm so excited for all of you for being in this space and um, for wanting to grow in this profession because we need need quality teachers now more than ever. So the 2021 Oregon Teacher of the Year journey has been phenomenal. I put some pictures up here of me winning the award um, when I got to go to the White House and meet the First Lady and the President, um, when we sat on the East Lawn and we had a whole ceremony. And I thought about the intersectionality of my educational experience and my lived experience and the trauma that we've been through and just how um, how strong I felt. And um, I just want to honor that because I wouldn't be here without quality teachers. And um, I just have appreciated my district and the support that I've received with my district. And so um, working with as Oregon State Teacher of the Year, I've been able to advocate and support diverse groups of students and really think about how we can elevate all educators. So um, I really have taken this journey and thought critically about how do we create a new educational legacy for our students? And specifically, I'm thinking of our native students, our indigenous students, but I want you to think critically about all students. I'm gonna get ready to share a little bit about Oregon's Tribal Shared History, Senate Bill 13 because um, you know this is within the last five years since 2017 when this bill passed. And so I want us to think about setting our students up for a new educational legacy by strengthening the indigenous presence in our classrooms today. And I love this quote by a Siletz tribal member and it says, our people have many hurts to be healed. Let us remember to be kind to each other and to help each other along the way toward better days for all of our people. We have so much to be proud of. Today, we celebrate survival against all odds. And I show these pictures, these personal pictures of my great grandmother, Margaret Lockwood, who was an Apache tribal member who never spoke English. She only spoke her Apache language and stayed on her reservation. And um, what her educational experience was like. And then 30 years later to my grandparents who left their reservation in Siletz and came to Reedsport. And then 10 years later from them, 20 years later, I should say, my educational experience, what that felt like, I shared that. And then now my own kids, Avery and Beckett, and how they get to experience more opportunities, more accurate information, history from multiple perspectives, and how they feel seen. And so I really want us to think about how we, I say we collectively, how we can make educational spaces more constructive for all students, but especially for our Native students. We want to really amplify Indigenous curriculum and make sure that LifeWays 
traditional life ways, traditional ecological knowledge is being shared. And we may have to be co-learners with our students as we do this work with Senate Bill 13. I always say I'm not an expert on my tribe and I'm not an expert in any one particular field except for loving students. And so I want to invite you to be co-learners with your students as you begin to learn more about Oregon's tribal shared history curriculum. I know when this bill was passing, I started with the modules and that's where I started. So I'm going to share a little bit about Senate Bill 13 and hopefully you can find some excitement and some energy around how you can be more culturally responsive and how you can become more familiar with this curriculum because it is such a gift. It's such a long awaited gift um, that, as you know, when I shared the new educational legacy, um, how we can disrupt those practices that my great grandmother and my grandparents never had the opportunity to experience. So with tribal shared history, I use this quote that says, all lessons must be relevant to our students' lives. Right, They have to find some entry. It doesn't mean they have to enjoy every single lesson, but they have to be able to find entry and to find a starting space to accept the knowledge that's coming their way. So when we look at tribal shared history curriculum, I put some bulleted points on there. You can read those. And then I'd like you to think about where do you see this fitting into your classroom? Because many will say social studies. Oh, I can see it fitting into that space. But really, can we incorporate it into our ELA and reading? Can we incorporate it into our math and our community building and our science and our social studies? How can we do that authentically? Because we really want to see tribal shared history as part of all of our curriculum. And so I think that this prospect of change just gets me so excited for you all. I'm going to move on to the modules because that's something that's given free from the um, Oregon Department of Education. You can go on, you can read all of the modules and you take a little assessment at the end of each one and then you're certified. So I think it ends up being like a four to six hour professional development and most districts will pay for that. And you'll see that under the modules, they have the essential understandings. And so those essential understandings are the life ways that really guide the curriculum. And so you can click on those from the Oregon Department of Ed. You can take those modules at any time. I always bookmark them on my desktop so I can go back. So where I start with this work is I start by just getting students familiar with the nine federally recognized tribes of Oregon, practicing saying their names, locating them, skills that I missed out on as a young child and that I think are so integral to doing this work and doing it well. And I'll tell you what, students get so excited when I ask students, um, well, when I first tell students, you know, that I'm indigenous or native to Oregon and share a little bit about my tribal history, you know, then everybody wants to be Indian. Everybody wants to be Native American and they all go home and ask their parents, am I Indian? You know, and that sort of excitement is so unique. And so um, I think that's a relationship, right? That's the culture that we've created in our classrooms where students actually want to take those risks and they want to get excited about. So I start with a map and we start locating our nine federally recognized tribes in Oregon. We talk about what it looks like to have land. We talk about what it looks like to be on a reservation. I always get students who ask, why do they only get that little plot of land? And I'll say, we'll talk about that in fifth or sixth grade as you get older. But really just becoming familiar. And all of the nine federally recognized tribes in Oregon have websites with a plethora of resources that we can use. And then you can find entry into emailing the educational departments and, and creating some sustainable relationships. Maybe your district already has a Title VI person or an equity director. And so they might already have those relationships formed, but if not, I would encourage you to reach out because um, you'll learn so much as you go along. And then I said that I taught second and fourth, and so I usually start out by really wanting to dispel some of the stereotypes around Native people. And so I start by asking, what do you think of when you hear the word Indian or Native American? And this was actually a seesaw assignment um, when we were on distance learning, but I do this every year in my classroom. And if you look at the responses, you can see that there are some students that think of Native Americans in the past, strictly in the past, right? I see culture, I see ancient, and I see past. And then you'll look on here and you'll see powwow and fry salmon dinner and fry bread. And that student is actually indigenous herself, I found out. Um, but quite an array of answers. And so then I think about, well, how can I dispel the stereotypes? How can I bring Native perspective into present day and power and presence? And I do that using the tribal shared history curriculum. And I do that through partnerships with Native people across the state. 
We also go on a field trip. So if there's any opportunities for you to do that in your area, I would say, please do that. A few years ago, we came to the Mini Nations Longhouse. I would say, think about the language of the tribal people. When I first introduced myself, that was my day in e language. So think about how we speak and how you speak in your classroom, I should say. And then how can you incorporate tribal languages into your classroom? Salets, um, Confederated Tribes of Salets, they have wonderful resources on Dainy, and um, you can go to their website. Grand Ronde has phenomenal website resources on Chinook Wawa, their language. They're actually teaching a class at Lane Community College right now. So let's think about um, language and how we can incorporate that into our classrooms. We do that with Spanish. I know at my school we're currently doing that. Let's do that with some native language because the power is there. Another thing that I like to do is invite authentic voice in from the nine federally recognized tribes in Oregon. And I've met so many people doing that work and I've shared the resources. So if you have someone doing that in your district, buddy up and share those resources. And then you'll see on the wheel here, those are the six P's of critical orientation um, that's, that is addressed in our tribal shared history curriculum. And I know I'm going kind of fast through this, but everything's on the website and I'm happy to partner and answer any questions as you begin this journey. Another thing that I love to do is talk about foods, traditional foods, um, indigenous foods, our favorites, and one of them, of course, is fry bread. And so using mentor text and author text to be able to support the work that you're doing in your classroom can be really valuable. And so I bring in this story, fry bread, and every year I make it with my students. We go into the cafeteria and it's a big old mess. And every year I go, why did I decide to do that again? But the students love it and they come back year after year and they make it at home with their families. And I want you to think about what that feels like, right? We're just making something at school, they're eating it, but when they go home and share it with their families, think about how that is really strengthening the indigenous presence in our classrooms today. And they're gonna remember those kinds of things. So the lift um, of how we do this work has to have multiple layers. And I think you have to consider within your district and your spaces, what other kinds of opportunities besides the tribal shared history curriculum are you presenting for our native students? What kind of spaces are being given for them? And so in my district, we celebrate Indigenous Peoples Day and we put up a small um, flag, a replica of each flag in the Bethel School District lawn. We have someone come in and drum and sing and we honor all of the 574 federally recognized tribes. So that might be something that you wanna move forward in your district, just that presence that teaches power. And um, thinking about, do you have a native parent group in your school or in your district? Do you have a Title VI coordinator that you can partner with in doing this work? And then are you thinking collectively about how we recognize Indigenous Heritage Month? What kinds of activities are you doing? What kind of opportunities are you providing for our native students to feel seen? When I first came to my district, we had none of this. And so right after 15 years, we've cultivated um, what that work can look like. We freedom dreamed how to do this work collectively. And we failed at many times, but here we are. You know, we're continuing to think about creating safe spaces for our native students and for all students. So again, going back to that lift of Oregon's Tribal Shared History Curriculum, these are some tips and tools that you can do to really think about full implementation of Oregon's tribal shared history. And I'm not gonna go through every one of them, but just know that there are resources out there and that um, as I've gone through this process, these are some steps that can help you be more sustainable. And I think, um, sharing these favorite mentor texts are great for teachers because you all love books and you all love using anchor texts, I'm sure. So these are some of my favorite mentor texts that I think about when I do my Native American units. And I don't wanna say just it's a unit for four weeks and then I'm done. I think about how to weave it throughout the year um, because we all know how that feels when we're like, oh, we're done with poetry or we're done with this. But if we can continue to think about cross-curricular choices, um, I think it stands with students longer. I think they hold on to that and they see themselves more in the curriculum and in the learning. So these are some of my favorite books. I hope that you love them. 
So we've talked about Senate Bill 13. We've talked about my journey. I want to think about how we wrap this work up. And it comes from you and thinking about your identity and what you bring to the space because you're going to really be the guide for many of your students. You're going to use them to help guide the curriculum and they're going to use you. And so that two-way learning is going to be a partnership. And with that partnership, I think you as the educator have to think critically about your identity. And so I want you to think about these questions. Who am I? What do I do? You do a lot of things in the middle of a school day. Who do you do it for? And why does it matter? When teaching about history and race and racial equity and social justice, there's a heavy lift for educators to be able to really think about multiple perspectives. And there are some years when I think, wow, I left off Asian American Heritage Month, or I could have done more here. When you think about your teaching identity and the parts of you that you're growing and sharing and diving into those resources, that's part of the ongoing learning. I think that will create this shared idea of power in your classroom automatically. And I really want us to think about this quote because I love RBG. And she says, fight for the things that you care about, but do it in a way that will lead others to join you. And so when you show up in those educational spaces and you're yourself and you're sharing resources and you're partnering and you're asking questions and you're sitting in discomfort, I want you to think about collectively how that feels with the other people in your buildings and your schools and your partnerships with parents. Because I think that my hope would be that you're honoring all of that growth and all of those parts of identity, and you're checking your bias, and really you're ultimately putting your students at the center of this work, which again is the engagement part of it, and it's the partnering that you're going to see the most results and the most academic successes. So if we were in person, I wanted to do this activity with you, but I think it's an activity that you might be able to find um, some entry into, maybe doing it as staff or on your own. And it's just an identity marker activity and reflection for you to think about um, this shared idea of power. Because there's some teachers, right, that go into spaces or that I'm even supporting where it's like, this is the idea and this is what I'm doing. And I want us to think more about collectivity and human-centered approaches. And so this identity activity is where you would look at all of these pieces of your identity and you would reflect on what parts of your identity have allowed you more privilege. And then you would think about accurate representations and you could use this with literature and math and you could use this with curriculum. And then you would think about what parts of your identity do you celebrate? What parts do you leave behind in educational settings? What part do you bring to professional? And what parts of your identities of your students are you really honoring and promoting? And this is a way to really think about creating more equitable outcomes and spaces for students. And so the first thing you would do is you would start eight of them. And you'd look at those eight and you'd say, okay, which one, you know, is really important to me? And then which one gives me more power and privilege? And then I'd say, okay, now I want you to just pick the top three. You know, those activities where you have to get smaller and smaller and shorter and shorter. And then you go, oh, this is landing some sort of way. And then you're going to go down to one. Which one of these are you most aware of on a daily basis? And then how does that guide your reflection? How does that guide your identity? How does that guide those stories that you bring into the classroom and those spaces? And what parts do you share and what parts do you not? And how does that impact educational equity? So this is a great activity for you to do as a reflective practitioner. And so I hope that, um, I know it's hard on the, on the screen right now, but I, I hope that you'll be able to use this and um, be able to put it in practice and take away some of these. I want to share for you my hopes for you and the future of teaching. And I want to be really direct here. Education did not start with black and brown students in mind. How do we set those students up and our students that are marginalized populations where they feel supported and they feel like they have access and they feel like that they can be seen for who they truly are? Because access is one thing that me as a person of color, am, I'm always struggling with. I'm always thinking differently about that. Also, I want to have a hope for you that you don't have to be the expert in this work. Equity work can be lonely, and it's really important to have allies and to grow your networking opportunities, and I hope that you'll consider me an ally. So when you think about that restorative justice in education, 
I want you to think about the challenges of doing this work and doing this work I'll say in rural communities can look different. So um, restorative justice is really important to me in the work that I do. And so up on the screen, I just want you to look at this graphic and I want you to think about the respect, the dignity and the mutual concern and how this can serve as a tool to really guide practice. And you could even come up with your own restorative justice circles in education and use those. You could even do those after implementation of Senate Bill 13 where you could think about each part of that and how that felt collectively. You could do that as a staff as well. Because voice, student voice, student leadership, social justice, I want you to think about what all those things mean to you in educational spaces, in schools, in your programs. History matters, race matters, justice matters, our language matters. Our connectivity matters, our difference matter. So I really like this idea of how we look at social justice from multiple perspectives and we look at pedagogy because that pedagogy is going to guide your practice. And I wanna insert that and I wanna keep saying that because that's going to help change the world of education. And I think that it's about time that we change the world together. Here are some resources that I use to strengthen my equity lens. I told you there's always books coming. I'm always um, reading up on things. I don't read cover to cover. I am a scanner, but um, I love culturally responsive teaching in the brain. I love indigenous children's survivance. The Anti-Way by Michelle Jacob. E anything by Eve Tuck. Here are some TED Talks on here, and you'll see the list goes on. So I would highly encourage you to pick one or two to read over the summer and to really think about how you can use this to guide your practice and to think critically about social justice work and how we humanize our educational spaces for students. I wanna end with just saying the journey to be a culturally responsive teacher is rooted in social justice work. It's rooted in the identity, the bias, and the larger community and the idea behind education. So we can do this work collectively together. Here are a few things um, where you can follow me on Twitter, or IG, my email's up here, and I just hope that we can partner to do this work together. Um, I'll leave you with the quote that says, be the change you wish to see in the world. Bye, thank you.